Okay, here we go. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whatever time of day it is, I hope it's good to be where you are because it is really amazing to be here today. My name is Baltimore Fats, and this is Meat City. Yeah, okay. Or otherwise known as How to Lose a Day. So here we go. We're starting with the Monday Sun, and I was getting ready to prepare my episode today when just getting my pages brought up, I came upon this ad right here. And I read it, and it really struck a chord with me today that it hadn't struck with me previously. And I've read this, I've read this paper about three times now. And so it says, Notice! Beginning Monday, September 10th, 1906, our city sales room and delivery department will be located at the northwest corner of Holiday and Pleasant Streets to facilitate the handling of our increasing city business. The location will be more convenient to our present patrons and dealers in general. We extend a cordial invitation to the public to inspect our plant, Kingan Provision Company, right? And listen, manager in the, the street quarters. And so... Like, at first, this is a really sort of unassuming ad. It doesn't really say much. It says that it's starting Monday. Today, if you were to get this paper in 1906 on the day it came out, the first day of the Jubilee, um, you know, it would be the first day for this sales room and delivery department. For, But it doesn't say what King and Company provides. <laughs> what are the provisions for King and Company? And so when my spidey sense started to go off with the King and the word King... I was like, well, maybe I should look that up real quick and see if I can find out anything. What did King and Provision Company provide? And so, here we go. <laughs> and so, for, right off, off the bat, it gives me this King and Company from this Indiana history. And so, we're going to get into this in a minute. But um, the first line here is that it traces its corporate lineage to Belfast, Ireland in 1845, where the brothers King and established the first slaughterhouse. Okay, so slaughterhouse, it's meat packing, it's a butcher, that kind of thing, right? And the next line gives it away even further, right? We got pork and beef packer right here. Um, and going down, I read further, and it said in 1875, King and merged with J.T. Sinclair, a firm founded in Belfast, Ireland. And so when I saw that, I was like, well, geez, is this another sort of meat packing firm? <laughs> in 1875 that they just sort of joined forces maybe this king and company and this jt sinclair and i started thinking about the dates we got 1845 here we got 1875 here you know and this is right at the the sort of height of the irish immigration you know the hundreds of thousands of irish who came over here escaping the potato famine right because when i looked it up right the great fan was 1845 to 1849 right when this is happening with this Kingan family <laughs> coming over here with their meats. <laughs> and so I was like, okay. And then that made me start to think about, like the, like I said, what I, I was thinking about the populations and how this whole thing is about, you know, uh, them creating false narratives to uh, feed the massive population explosion that happened, not just out of Ireland, but Germany and Poland and other areas around the world as well. You know, there were a mass migration in the mid-19th century, you know, especially to America. It made me kind of think about this with the with the with the Great Famine, because of course famines and wars were great excuses for establishing population booms, right? You lost a lot of people, you gained a lot of people, kind of thing, right? And at some point, I'm sure I went over it somewhere, and I'll, I'll probably get back to it. I don't want to make this one too long. But like half of Ireland came over here in response to this. I just decimated the actual population of Ireland. So who was like even left in Ireland? <laughs> and but I found a better one. So let's go with that. <laughs> and it's this historic Indianapolis because they make their final resting place. Yeah, and that's funny that I said that <laughs> or that it came out that way. But they end up in Indianapolis. Right? And here's, here's their meatpacking plant in Indianapolis. This massive, massive brick structure. Look at this thing, the size of it. And it has, it tells you where its, be where it's beef killing floor is, its canning department, its it's pork killing floor, you know, it's it's chiller rooms, everything, right? I'm not sure exactly what year this is. I did not look that up, but if it has chillers, it's definitely 
1880s probably, somewhere in there at the earliest. All right, and it's Kingan and Company Limited, right, where reliable meats are prepared. <laughs> and so I love this picture here, and I love these pigs down here. And so I, I downloaded this so I could take a closer look. So let's take a closer look. Right, and here they are. They're, they're walking on the ice. They're laughing and having a good time. And this one's getting his skates on, and he's no dummy. He's got a hat with a feather and some sort of hand warmer. We've got this creepy dreaming pig down here. There he is. Look at him. I guess he's not dreaming. His eyes are open. But why is he laying down like that? And then up in the corner here, well, we've got the Kingan's Fisherman. <laughs> All right, we got this creepy pig drooling up here. They even put drool in there. Why? For what? Why are you creeping people out with that drooling pig? Right, and along the top it says, greetings. <laughs> this may have been a postcard or some other advertisement or something. Right, and the fat pigs are holding them up. And right, like I said, the, 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 all the departments it has. Right, this really amazing advertisement. Which, of course, a lot of this, like this stuff, reminds me of the movie Motel Hell. <laughs> which I'm going to have to find a way to work in here now. <laughs> so let's continue on with the article anyway. <laughs> I got that out of the way. And so let's go with this, with the article here, right? And it's, a, it's from historicindianapolis.com. And of course, Indianapolis and Baltimore have a very auspicious connection, don't they? The cults ended up in Indianapolis. <laughs> Probably no coincidence there. <laughs> so there's the picture again. And so when Thomas and Samuel Kingan board a boat, and it's interesting they list only the two, and there was clearly three brothers. We have here Thomas and Samuel, but there was also James. Right? They were never going to, they were had no intention of landing on the banks of the White River, which is the river in Indianapolis, in which I really know nothing about Indianapolis, <laughs> except my football rooting interests. <laughs> and so they were the owners of this prosperous meatpacking plant in Northern Ireland, right? And they were expanding their operations to the United States. Now, this is, the other article said 1845, right? And that's from their family archives in Indianapolis. 1845, so by 18... 48, they were moving to New York, right? So within three years, at the height of the potato famine, they're taking their meatpacking business and moving to New York. <laughs> and so they were doing this in an effort to increase production and fill the gaps in the British market left by the potato famine. And I'm like, and so I was thinking, about how do you avoid, you know, a potato famine or falling victim to a potato famine? <laughs> <laughs> then by what better way to do it than by uh, than by going into the meat business, <laughs> right? Pigs will eat anything, and cows eat grass, and there's nothing but grass in Ireland. I I don't understand how this potato famine affected anybody. Just eat meat. <laughs> I mean, you can certainly sustain yourself on meat. You don't need potatoes. <laughs> you got you got other greens you can you can have if you needed a green. <laughs> That I'm sure grew in Ireland and England at the time. Right? <laughs> so what better way to beat it, right, than going into the meat meat business? And so they come over here to fill the British market gaps, right? And they open a plant in Brooklyn in 1851. Right? And two years later, they open another plant in Cincinnati. But sadly, the luck of the Irish was not with the brothers. By the end of the decade, both of their U.S. plants had burned to the ground. <laughs> There are two U.S. plants in Brooklyn, New York, and in Cincinnati, Ohio, burned to the ground, along with their, <laughs> along with clearly their plant in ba in Baltimore, <laughs> and if they're opening a new sales room and delivery department, <laughs> their old sales room and delivery department, maybe not plant, but their old sales room and delivery department burned down, so we got a sales room and delivery apartment <laughs> in Baltimore, and we got. Two plants, one in Brooklyn and one in Cincinnati that fall victim to fire. All right, these early on, and then the Baltimore office would have been later. All right, it says, undaunted, the King and Brothers picked up stakes again and moved to Indianapolis, which was rapidly growing as a railroad hub. I'm sure it was, because we'll see where that what's going on there in a minute. And so they built a five-story plant on the west side of the White River, which was this, right? Five-story plant, massive, massive... You know, and it's funny, where are the farms and how are they getting the pigs and stuff to these warehouses and cows to these warehouses from farms and in sufficient numbers to, you know, keep 
an operation like this going, unless, of course, they were actually raising them in some of these warehouses, which kind of brings me to my theory about the population explosions and how, well, if pigs and so forth could be bred in captivity as such, well, why not people, right? <laughs> you know, and if, especially if, or if you're working the angle that is coming to me from Baltimore, which is that the crown, which is a many tendrilled beast, right, is working the reset angle with recovering what was here before and establishing a new paradigm for the massive numbers of people they are expecting, all right? And whether they're ahead of schedule or on time or behind schedule, by a few years, that doesn't matter because they're going to get it all straight by the time they really flick the switch in the 20s, is when I'm guessing it happens. So let's continue with this, all right? We'll, we'll put that out there. So. <laughs> So they built their five but unfortunately, the third time was not the charm for them either. And the new Indianapolis facility, the largest pork house in the world, <laughs> was destroyed by arson the following May, along with an immense amount of lard and hams. Right? The intense heat from the burning pork products made it impossible for firefighters to extinguish the flames. Those pork products, you know, cr create intense heat when that when that grease starts burning, right? And Maybe that could be a contributing factor to why the fire in Baltimore burnt the way it did. <laughs> right? The King and Brothers sales room <laughs> had all that lard in it. <laughs> but if the Kingans had learned anything during their short time in America, however, it was the value of a good fire insurance policy. How did no insurance adjuster see this pattern? <laughs> They just kept making money off of these fire, uh, the, these arson scams. It's unbelievable, right? And so the business quickly grew. They were selling their meats to the Union Army and shipments to back to England. And they bought a competing pork house on the other side of the railroad in Indianapolis, right? They were rolling large, the Kingans, right? And then two years later, they merged with this Belfast firm of J&T Sinclair to form Kingan and Company. And so by the end of the 19th century, they had this massive, massive warehouse, right? And so the Sinclairs come in, and this merger with the Sinclairs in 1875, I think it said, right? And so this company was a massive employer for Irish immigrants. And not only that, they, they encouraged Irish immigrants to ship their stuff in advance, and they would put it in specific housing prepared for these Irish immigrants that are coming. And, and then when you look at the, the timeline, you know, with the with the um, with the potato famine, which again, when you're looking at at excuses for repopulation, famine is a big one. They keep throwing these famines in the history, so you think there keeps needing to be reasons for these repopulations. Oh, there were people, but they oh they got all wiped out by disease. Oh, there were people, but there were all these hundred years of wars, and oh, there were people, but you know this happened, right? And so if you're unleashing these hundreds of thousands. And again, I, like I said, was just saying, you know, you grow them in warehouses and you, you speak a certain language to them in a certain way and, and you ship them out on boats and you sail them around for a little while. You bring them back in and you say, welcome to America, you know, and whatever they were, German, Irish or whatever. Right. And then you use your expositions and your jubilee parades and so on and so forth to imprint your history on them because it's better than the history they knew growing up, which was warehouse life, you know, packing cans for food and stuff like this. <laughs> <laughs> and not having much of an education to being exposed to, you know, cities and all this new information shows and, I, I, you know, all the distraction that they have and they, they force feed the history on you and they're getting ready to reinforce that through the, the, impl the implementation of schooling and so on and so forth, you know. That's kind of where we're going with this, right? It's Reset City. <laughs> and so I, I think about this time and... If they're a major employer and they're moving from Ireland first to New York and then to Cincinnati and then to Indiana, so there's this westward expansion thing happening. And I'm always also looking for sort of crown connections. And when I see the name like Kingan and I saw the name Sinclair here, I was like Belfast. Okay, now that can start tying in. You know, the anytime I have names, families that can bring me back to the British Isles, that makes me think the crown. Which, of course, is like I like I tried to say earlier, is the main organization in charge of the reclamation of whatever disaster they're reclaiming from, whether it was something that happened in the 1600s, 1700s, 1,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, whatever. Right? We, just, we just don't know, but there was something, at least it's the way the story is spinning, that made this necessary, right? And 
And so I want to try to connect these families to the families that I know, right? See if there's any dynastic connections and stuff. <laughs> and so I started with the name that got me here, which was Kingan. Right? And so here's the Kingan history and family crest. And of course, you look at the crest right away. And oh my God, <laughs> it's the same helmet <laughs> as the Calverts and the Bonapartes for the Kingan family. Unbelievable. And they're not even Irish. They're Scottish. And they come from the Picts. Right? And they lived in the barony of Kinghorn in the county of Fife. <laughs> It says the surname of Kingan was first found in Fife, right? The historic former royal burgh of Kinghorn, now a town which derives its name from the Scottish Gaelic Cain Grona, meaning head of the marsh or head of the bog. Perhaps best known as the place where King Alexander III of Scotland died, right? Steeped in history, including the former castle in Kinghorn, which there's none, none of that remains today, I think I read. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> And so I wanted to look up the Sinclair name too. And so I just want to, I got, I just have to plug this, this, this webpage real quick, <laughs> houseofnames.com. And so if you want to find out how your family is connected to the dynastic worm night <laughs> colonization project, <laughs> recovery project, houseofnames.com. <laughs> and before I get to the Sinclair uh, page at thehouseofnames.com. I wanted to, I looked them up at another place first, right? And so look at this, right? The St. Clair, Sinclair family. And look at that coin they put right at the top. If that's not a Roman era coin, I don't know what is. <laughs> it may be even older than that, right? So the Sinclair name, ancient, ancient name. Right? And so, of course, we know that they're in the meatpacking business. And and so let's see, what else, what else were they up to? Right? Thomas and John Sinclair of Hopefield Court. Of course, we know that they were meatpacking, right? And so they were preventer merchants from Tomb Street. On Tomb Street in Belfast, is, if they're meat, if they're meat packers, what's available on Tomb Street? Dead meat. <laughs> right? And so they're the largest, they have the largest fleet of merchant ships coming out of Belfast at this time. All right, merchant ships. And so they have, and they merge with the Kingans and their meatpacking firm, right? So now they they now have the means to get their meat back and forth from England and New York, back to Ireland, and so forth, and to England and whatnot, right? And isn't it convenient they have these big merchant ships? You know what they can also do? They can also transport a large number of these mass immigrants, you know, wherever they're coming from. Or at least that's part of the cover, at least using that cover as a cover story you could, because right? they put that in there somewhere in here that they, you know, they often took immigrants, right, um, to Australia. They were involved in the colonization, heavily involved in the colonization of Oceania, <laughs> uh, Australia, New Zealand, and that area, All right? And... So I thought that was pretty amazing. So I wanted to look them up on the House of Names. <laughs> and it gives them the same helmet too. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. Right? The Sinclairs now, the Kingans, the Calverts, the Bonapartes. But I looked them up a little bit further and I believe a House of Names wah, wah, gets a little bit wrong. Or somebody does anyway. And I did look, I looked up Kingan as well and they, they stayed consistent. But um, Sinclair has many, many different helmets, many different Worm Knight helmets. So Sinclair is a part of every house, I guess, is the way I, this is reading to me. I don't know. That's just kind of coming to me right now. <laughs> um, right. So here, what it says about the family is that it derived, right? The Sinclair surname was a Norman habitation name. All right, so now, you know, Miss Havisham, here's your Normans coming into the story, <laughs> right? And, right, it's, it, the surname is first found at the Barony of Rosslyn, right? And Rosslyn, I'm thinking, Rosslyn, like, like, Da Vinci Code Rosslyn? Like, like, Holy Grail? King Arthur and the Holy Grail Rosslyn? <laughs> yep. <laughs> the Jesus Family Tomb, Holy Bloodline. Right, Knights Templar, where do they work? They work on Tomb Street in Belfast, this Sinclair family. 
protectors of the Jesus family tomb, the Sinclairs, and the Holy Grail, which of course I brought in to the, from the Welsh side, you know, which came up in that Fata Morgana episode that I did. <laughs> Right? So the, the connections are getting, you know, even crazier now. The Sinclair name coming up big in Baltimore and going through to Indianapolis, right, through this westward expansion. By 1862, Indianapolis had become a major hub, and well, look where it is, right? You know, you can you see why that would be the case, right? But that there's really nothing to the west by 1860s. A little bit of gravity railroad going on. Some mining operation or something happening over here. Who knows? 1860, right? But it's interesting that if you go to 1870, let's see if I do that real quick. And by 1870, right, you got a line going all the way across through to California. And I guess this is San Francisco up here, right? I've, uh, <laughs> I've never been. <laughs> And so in the 10 years that the Civil War is happening and all this immigration is happening, you know, who's building this railway line all the way across there? Who's paying for the war? Who's paying these immigrants? What is happening here, right? And so I th think that, you know, the, now that the Sinclairs, they have the means to transport these numbers, wherever they're getting these numbers of people from, <laughs> they have the means to populate the Irish as they see fit. <laughs> And and so yeah, so the Holy Grail, Rosslyn, all that, right? And so um, we're going back to 1162, that far back. Right? They're in the Doomsday Book. We all know how important that is, right? And then it says that uh, a Sinclair fought with Robert, with King Robert the Bruce at Bannockburn for the freedom of Scotland over the English. I guess is that the way that's. Or to keep Scotland free, rather. I don't. I don't know that story in full. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so the Sinclairs at Bannockburn with Robert the Bruce coming in with the Normans and William the Conqueror, who really wasn't much of a conqueror, as we're gonna get. <laughs> they have many, many different warm night helmets. <laughs> They're associated with the Holy Grail and Jesus and tombs, and they come from Tomb Street. <laughs> it just. How does this happen? <laughs> How does how does an unassuming ad for a meatpacking plant unleash this whole torrent of information about that can be, you know, applied to uh, the reset narrative if you wanted to? And I'm not doing a very good job of it. There, are, I'm sure if I if I really work this material, I could do it way better. But it's just way too much fun to do it as it happens, right? And I just went over this stuff. For the first, I really noticed it this morning and came up with this presentation this morning. <laughs> How does it happen? <laughs> and so I was looking for other connections, right? And, and so the families stay connected. They, they intermarry as well, these Kingans and these Sinclairs, right? They have politicians and they still have pork manufacturers. This guy becomes sheriff of Down and so forth. And where else could I find Sinclairs, right? So there's a Sinclair Community College. There's a Sinclair Oil Corporation, right? That's pretty interesting. <laughs> Let's see what is what does that say? They have the dinosaur. That's like in the that's like in the Toy Story dinosaur. <laughs> um, does it give us any history here? Sinclair history. Let's take a look. Starts in the 1900s with the dinosaur, and of course the dinosaur, and what the dinosaur is comes in in the late 19th century. You know, I didn't, I don't think I've touched on the dinosaurs much, but interesting that this is the time frame where dinosaurs start to become part of the oil market, right? <laughs> Fossil fuels through the Sinclairs. He went from a penniless druggist to the richest man in Kansas in five years. Yeah, Harry Ford Sinclair did. <laughs> Ford? Come on. <laughs> are you kidding me with that? So we're, what are we talking here? So the very early 1900s, 1904, this Sinclair. And so you have to wonder how connected to the Sinclairs are they, right? And so I think it's interesting that there's an oil Sinclair family that could be brought up right away. And then there's this one, and this is the big one. <laughs> the Sinclair Broadcast Group, right? The second largest television station operator in the United States by number of stations owned, followed the next star, next star, 
right? I wonder what the next star is going to be. Right? Uh, owning and operating a total of 193 stations across the country in over 100 markets. And they're, they're, they're the right-wing media, right? They're not the fake media, no. They're the right-wing media. Yes. <laughs> yes, right-wing, right? And so they stand for more conservative causes, and they're propping up Trump in that aspect of the, the political spectrum, you know? Um, oh, they, and so just amazing, this massive, massive broadcasting conglomerate. And and a lot of people will say that they're, they are the most evil company in the world right now because of their conservative connections, right? If you're on the other side, if you're on the progressive liberal side and you buy all the stuff that, that Gannett and Associated Press or whatever is putting out, I don't know the names of those media outlets, but, you know, they're working both sides of it, of course, and it comes down, you know, it, you know, it works its way up to the pyramid. And so these are just two parts of the same plane on that pyramid. All right, working against each other deliberately. All right? And it has its headquarters in Hunt Valley, <laughs> which is technically Baltimore. Right, And it's founded by this Julian Sinclair Smith, right, who is an electrical engineer and television executive. And he finds this Sinclair Broadcast Group with a single television station right, in Baltimore. <laughs> Right? WBFF TV, which is Fox 45 today, in, in Baltimore, the Fox affiliate. Unbelievable. <laughs> so the Sinclair family still alive and well in Baltimore. And not only are they still alive and well in Baltimore, they're running the second big, biggest media conglomerate in America out of it. <laughs> Unbelievable. And that it's coming, that the right wing side is coming out of Baltimore, which is a democratic town, it's a liberal town. So again, you want to find evidence that there really is no division and that they're playing the same game from both sides in the same places. Well, there it is. <laughs> you know, the Sinclair Broadcast broadcast Group, the right-wing broadcast group, coming out of Baltimore, which is the ultimate in liberal left-wing towns. <laughs> it's, you just can't make this stuff up. You know? And especially when you're looking into like these dynastic family bloodlines and connections to them running the show all this time. And so I got a, a lovely email from Michelle Gibson. She watched my uh, Bonaparte video and she sent me this picture, which is amazing. Right? She said, look at the resemblance between Charles Bonaparte and Saddam Hussein. And I can totally see it. Right? I feel like I'm going to be on Maury here, but you know, look at the nose. Right? <laughs> look at these cheeks. Look at this chin. Right? Yeah, maybe the ears even. I don't get quite a good ear shot here, but you could definitely see the bloodline, the family traits connecting these two men. No doubt about it. You know, and you can, if you want to, take your theory so far as to say they could be actors of the same people, morphing, and so on and so forth. You take that theory as long as you'd like to. I love it. <laughs> but I'm going with that they're the bloodline. They're related. These guys are cousins somehow. Right, <laughs> because it's all part of the same family is running everything. So I think that's amazing. And thank you to Michelle for sharing this picture with me. And I said it before and I'll say it again. <laughs> if you're not watching Michelle's channel, you really need to be. Unbelievable. She's doing great work <laughs> over there. Right. And so I thought, what an amazing story. See, this is that has, you know, this is what the Jubilee has done. It has opened everything up. And it's going to get crazier and crazier as we go. This was something that what, I hadn't even noticed yet. And I've been looking at this material hardcore for like two weeks. And this is just by looking at the day a little harder, looking at the Monday sun a little harder. <laughs> I mean, it's unbelievable. And so just to top this one off, because this one's got an unbelievable cherry that really doesn't have much to do with Baltimore, but it does because the Matrix wanted me to see it today, <laughs> is that when I was searching... The Sinclairs, the third one down, you know, because it says the Sinclair of Hopefield House, and I don't think I really touched on that. The Hopefield House was a house out of Belfast that was formed by the Presbyterians, so not Catholics, right? And they're the ones that set up the merchant business, these Presbyterian Hopefield House people. And so when I saw the name Hopfield come up, and so close to the top of my search results, I was like, well, maybe he must be a relative, and that the E fell off somewhere. In, during the immigration process, of course, because they're processing hundreds of thousands, right? Aren't they? <laughs> and I was like, well, do I look him up? And of course, immediately the gematria jumps right out at me. July, his birthday is July 15th, 
1933, and he's an American scientist, scientist most widely known for his invention of an associative neural network in 1982. I was like, yeah, I, be I better look him up now. <laughs> and so here he is. All right. And before I get into the neural networks, let's look at him real quick as a person. All right. So he was born in 1933 to a Polish physicist father and a physicist mother. Right? And so what is that going to make him? Of course, it's going to make him a doctor of physics. Right? And he's going to graduate from Cornell, Ivy League, no slouch, of course. Right? And he's going to go on to work at Bell Labs, which what are they doing? Communications and things like that, allegedly, and working on all kinds of technology, right? Bell Laboratories, right? Because they come up in Georgetown, Bell Labs, in the, in the uh, town of George episode. All right, there's no coincidences that all these things can be tied back to the same names, right? All right, and he goes on to Berkeley and the California, you know, California Institute of Technology and Chemistry and Biology and so on and so forth, all right? So this is one of the few um, people who don't, at least on the surface, find their way through Hopkins. I'm sure he found his way into Hopkins somehow, right? And so in 1986, he was founder of the Computation and Neural Systems PhD program at Caltech. <clears throat> and so let's look at what the associative neural network is that he invented in 1982, this Hopfield network. And so a neural network is a network or circuit of neurons, or in a modern sense, an artificial neural network composed of artificial neurons or nodes. Thus, a neural network is either biological, artificial, uh, is either a biological neural network made up of real biological neurons or an artificial neuron network for solving artificial intelligence problems. And now, I don't know, something about the way this is phrased makes me want to superimpose it on top of the reset paradigm. And so that the neurons are the people, right? And and now we're in a circuit. And so are we, are our bodies artificial houses for these neurons, right? Or biological houses, right? Maybe not artificial, but are our bodies biological houses for these neurons, right? Are we, is the neuron our soul? <laughs> Right? or consciousness, our mind, whatever you want to make of it, right? And so that's just kind of what this made me think. This made me think of that, right? And, you know, artificial neurons, biological neuron networks. So perhaps our bodies are a biological neuron network and our memories and subconscious are this artificial intelligence, right? Right, because it says here, a biological neuron network is composed of a group or groups of chemically connected or functionally associated neurons. Chemically connected either by our DNA, right, or functionally associated by our work relationships, friends, things like that, right? A single neuron may be connected to many other neurons, and the total number of neurons and connections in a network may be extensive. So think about that laid out over, you know, the population, right? And that the connections are called synapses, and our connections are like, like I said, the um, what is it a family connection? You know, we trigger our synapse when we're with our family. You know, the synapse could be the work relation, right? And so our our synapses are triggered into the work mode when we go into work. Right, this our work is the artificial construct for these neur this neuron control network. Right? I hope I'm making sense here. <laughs> and and so the preliminary the preliminary and so this is what they're they're trying to lay out with their system. You know, how do we control? Because they realize that our brains are electric frequencies and they can be controlled, and so they. That's what they do. They control it, and they can, and they look to make this artificial intelligence, which they want to implant upon us. So we lack free will, and I think that's what his, what Hopfield's Hopfield network is. And it says for it's a, a form of recurrent artificial neural 
neural network. And so it serves as a content addressable or associative memory system with binary threshold nodes. And, you know, make of what you will, if you want to put this, if you want to transpose this onto people like I'm trying to do here, right? You know, you make of the binary node what you will, right? But, you know, it's an associative memory system. We associate our memories with our families, with our work, with our school, what we're taught, so on and so forth, all right? And so it says, um, the units are binary threshold units, all right? And they take on different values for their states, and the value is determined by whether or not the unit's input exceeds their threshold. And so I want to, they go through a lot of math in here, but this becomes a lot, I mean, it gets, it kind of snaps into, into shape for me here with the initialization of the hot field networks, right? And it's done by setting the values of the units to the desired start pattern. Now, just let that sink in again. <laughs> setting the values of the units to the desired start pattern. You, you couldn't be talking about resets here for, for neural networks that are the human brain or the human animal. You couldn't be talking about that, could you? Right? With your parades and your product expositions and, and so forth, right? You, you wouldn't be talking about that, right? Because it says here that the repeated updates are then performed until the network converges into an attractor pattern. And so every so many years, every 25 years, every 50 years or whatever, you add an update in there, you give them an upgrade of the printing press, you give them an upgrade of the steam engine, you give them an upgrade of electricity, you know, every so often you upgrade them, you, you keep it current, you keep it moving, right, because convergence is generally assured. And Hopfield proved that the attractors of this nonlinear dyna dyma dynamical system are stable. Right? So it'll just keep going. Right. <laughs> and so, I don't know, like I said, it's complete conjecture on my part. It's just a weird connection that my brain made <laughs> to this hot field, to the neural networks. And because what really I believe this is, is implanting memories, finding a way to create false memories and implant them in people, right? Creating these artificial neuron networks or treating our brain, our neurons in our brains, with these frequencies that control them into these network patterns for them, right? And that's why we have so much technology today and the 5Gs and, you know, it all starts with really like the radio more than anything as I'm going to get going forward. So just amazing connections that just how is it that this unassuming ad <laughs> for King and Provision could lead me down a rabbit hole like that? <laughs> So that's why there wasn't a Jubilee episode today, guys. <laughs> and so hopefully I'll get to one tomorrow or Friday. But this is just what happens. You know, sure, this isn't like a squirrel <laughs> because I didn't intend for this to happen. But it definitely was more like a full-on episode. And, yeah, so was, who has the meats? <laughs> Baltimore Fats has the meats. <laughs> Hope you enjoy this one. And until the next one, cheers, guys.